John Fuhr once said that it's a good thing that most of us can't remember our past lives. Because we could very easily get fixated on all the wrong that was done to us, all the issues that never got settled. And we might want to go back and settle some old scores. Of course, there'd be no end to that, because then the people whose scores we had settled, they'd probably want to settle some scores with us. Because that's the other part of potentially remembering your past lives, all the wrong you did, the ways you harmed people that you'd be embarrassed to think about now. But just the thought of that leaves us with an important lesson. No scores are ever fully settled. Things don't come to closure. This is the nature of samsara, it just keeps wandering on and on and on. No story comes to an end. We watch plays, read books. where things come to a satisfying closure, and part of us would like to see that in our own lives as well. But one of the things you have to accept when you come to the practice is just that fact. There is no closure. And the more the mind insists on trying to find closure, the more it weighs itself down and keeps itself in that on, going, wandering on. And so when we think about the whole issue of past lives, it's good to think of it as a general principle without getting into the details. It's useful because it's one way of getting out of our own individual stories right now, the narratives we've brought from this lifetime concerning our parents, our relationship to them, our relationship to friends, people who've done us wrong, people who've mistreated us, how we're going to respond to that. And you have to look at the Buddha's own night of awakening. That's a good paradigm for how to deal with these things. Remember, the first knowledge dealt with his knowledge of his past lives, remembering what he had done here, what he'd done there, who he had been, what he'd eaten, what pleasures and pains he experienced, going back many, many aeons. But he didn't stop there. just with the narratives, I'm trying to figure out, well, how can I settle that issue, or how can I settle this score? The sheer multitude of all those stories, all those narratives, was enough to induce a huge feeling of dispassion. From there he went on to the question, well, was this true only of him, or is it true of other, other beings? And Is there any pattern to all of this? Because when you just see the line of narratives, it's not really clear, clear what the pattern is. So in his next knowledge, he inclined his mind to knowledge of how beings in general die and are reborn, and saw that this happens to everybody, and that the way you're reborn depends on your karma. It turns out karma is very complex. Sometimes you do something really bad in this lifetime, but you have a nice next time, lifetime after that, because you have other good karma as well. There is the general pattern, though, that actions taken on unskillful intentions under the influence of wrong views lead to suffering. Actions based on skillful intentions under the influence of right views, showing respect for the noble ones, those lead to happiness. That's the basic principle. And that's what we're going to focus on right here, right now. 
And that's exactly what he did. From his second knowledge, then he focused in on the present moment, looking to see what his mind was doing at that moment that was causing stress and suffering, and what qualities he could develop to put an end to that stress and suffering. Seeing that the suffering and came from craving and clinging, and so what he could do to induce a feeling of dispassion for whatever it was he craved and clung to. Without any concern for tying up loose ends or bringing things to closure. But simply realizing that he had to focus on what he was doing at that moment. to put an end to this whole cycle. But it was important that he was able to look at the big picture before he settled in on the present moment. If we don't do that ourselves, we just have our own personal issues and bring them right into the, the breath, right into the body right now. And all the questions of, why did this happen to me, or why did he or she do that to me? Like, how can I allow this to happen? Those get very large. But if you see them as part of a larger pattern, you can develop a sense of dispassion for them without having to tease them out and go back to your childhood and sort out what happened. But just look at the universality of it all. There's that series of suttas where the Buddha talks about one, which is more the water in the oceans or the tears that you've shed through your many lifetimes. And you've shed more tears. He talks about how hard it is to find anyone who is not your mother, or not your father, not your brother, not your sister, not your son, not your daughter in previous lifetimes. So when you think of all the issues you have with your parents and multiply that by a huge number of lifetimes, it's an enormous number of unsettled issues that you've got with everybody in this room everybody you've ever met. And the image that you very rarely hear mentioned, there's one sutta where he tells the monks that, which is greater? The amount of blood you've shed from having had your, thro <coughs> from having had your throat slit in previous lifetimes, or the water in all the oceans? That's one to think about, because he says you've shed more blood just from your throat than there is water in the oceans. Imagine the blood you've shed from other parts of your body. So potentially there's a huge number of unsettled issues from the past. But as the Buddha said, just thinking about that is enough to develop dispassion for everything. to want to find release from all this, because there is no closure, but there is release. So when you find yourself bringing issues from your family, issues from your work, issues from your daily life, your childhood. into the meditation, when you find that they invade the meditation. Remember what the Buddha did. He didn't stop with just his own narratives. He thought about the huge picture, how universal it all was. Now it's impossible to bring these things to closure. And the only answer is to develop dispassion, together with a sense of compassion for all the other beings in the world who've also shed all those many tears and have lost all that blood. Because as we often know, and say when a parent has harmed a child, you look into the parent's background, well that parent was harmed by his or her parent, and it goes on and on and on, way, way back. So there's no one who hasn't suffered a lot, 
and the sad thing is that we just keep inflicting our sufferings on other people. Parents inflicted on their children, children turn around and inflicted on their parents. There's that sad story in the book Into the Wild, the young man who feels betrayed by his father. His father was a stern disciplinarian, always demanding very moral conduct from his son. And then the son finds out later that the father was a bigamist, loses respect for the father, just leaves the family right after school, goes off without telling them where he went. The parents have no idea what happened to him. They finally get word that it, if someone has found a dead body up in Alaska, and it may be their son, and sure enough it is their son. And so in the last scene of the book, the parents fly up to the spot where the, the boy passed away. There's a school bus just outside the boundaries of Denali National Park. And so they leave a suitcase of food there, canned food, with a little note to whoever might find that suitcase of canned food. If, if you haven't contacted your parents to let them know where you are, please let them know. They miss you. So who knows? You can place blame on the father, you can place blame on the son. But it doesn't erase the fact that there's been a lot of suffering. And if we don't decide to pull out of the suffering we've been inflicting on one another through our desires to close the issue or to bring a particular issue to closure, there's never going to be any end. There's a story in the commentary of a major wife who was barren, and so the husband gets a minor wife, and the minor wife has a child. The major wife is afraid that then the minor wife is going to take over because she's had the child, given her husband an heir, so she kills the child. And then both of them die, and then they get reborn as a fox and a chicken. And the fox comes in and steals the chicken's eggs. And then they get reborn as other kinds of animals, and back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, to finally, in the time of the Buddha, one of them. They're both born as human human beings, both born as women. One of them has a child, for some reason the other woman is after her to kill the child. So the first one gets chased into the monastery where the Buddha is staying. So both of the women are there right in front of the Buddha, and so he tells them the story of their many, many, many past lives. So the question is, well, where are you going to place the blame? goes back and forth, back and forth like this. The only way is to make up your mind that you're going to stop it right here. Enough of this. So when you look at the larger picture, it's a lot easier to let go of the particulars of your own suffering, of your own narratives. The old game of place the blame and say, enough. This contemplation of the universality of suffering, the universality of this wandering on, the Buddha says this is enough to induce a strong sense of samvega, dismay over the whole process. And the best response to that is to develop a sada, a sense of conviction. This is the way out by practicing what the Buddha called the karma that leads to an end of karma, in other words, the, the Noble Eightfold Path, developing these qualities in mind so that you don't have to continue the stories. You just drop them. Then focus on what you're doing right now to cause suffering for yourself right now. That's the only way these stars can be brought to an end.